Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Another beautiful morning in South Florida from Minnesota, so it's a change of pace. All right, so I'm here to y'all to share a little bit about my testimony up to this point. So started uh, how I'm here, I guess, um, a couple weeks ago. It's crazy how God works. I sat over in the coffee shop uh, prior to going to work and just uh, in the Word and drinking coffee, two things I love to do. And Tim comes over and asks if I'd be, uh, well, first of all, he gets to know me and kind of hears my story and asks if I'd be willing to sh- share my testimony with the church. So um, I don't think that's a coincidence. It's obviously the hand of God in that. And so that's why I'm before you all today. A wise preacher once told me that there is no testimony without a test. And I couldn't agree more with that. So here's my testimony. I was born and raised in central Minnesota in a town of about 3,000 people. Grew up in a very stable home, which we were super involved in uh, Assembly of God Church. It was such a blessing having that seed planted in my heart from such a young age. I loved baseball growing up as well. Anytime I would get asked what I wanted to do when I grow up, I said I wanted to play in the MLB. Some would laugh, some would encourage, and everything in between, but it never seemed to sway my ambition to make this dream a reality. At 16 years old, kind of started this roller coaster I've been on the last nine years that has been so beautifully crafted by the master potter, I couldn't have in a million years imagined that things would shake out the way they have, that I would be standing here sharing my testimony with you all. So, in the summer after my sophomore year of high school, my parents separated and my dad eventually filed for divorce as things got ugly really quick. This was an extremely difficult time in my life. I was kind of forced to grow up and be more independent at a young age. And nine years later, I wouldn't change a thing as it was the best thing for me. There were many nights where I would cry myself to sleep and ask myself, why do I have to go through this of all people? (laughs) At the time I was kind of turned off by Christianity and I was beginning to walk away from my faith. I chose to harness this energy and this rage that I had built up into my body in my training for baseball. This made me feel sane. Baseball was my escape and I bet on myself and went all in on making this dream a reality. Honestly, to the point where it was unhealthy as I thought this was my only way out. Fast forward a summer later when I committed to Creighton University, a division one school in Omaha, Nebraska to play baseball. This was sort of the first big step in my journey of making the MLB. I came out my senior year and started to receive some draft interest from MLB teams, but then I ended up tearing my shoulder labrum, an injury with a very low percentage of pitchers coming back, the same as they were. I was absolutely crushed by this. Parents were going through divorce and everything that came with that, and now this. I was so lost and so confused didn't know where to turn as the one thing that made me happy still was taken away from me. I was at rock bottom with nowhere to turn but back to Christ, who welcomed me and welcomes all of his children back into his arms willingly. That's unconditional love that can only come from Jesus Christ. And from that day forward, I recommitted my life to Christ almost after almost two years of growing apart from him. Born again, a salvation that is readily available to anyone. But I think the important thing to note here as I continue to share this story is that just because Jesus was the Lord of my heart now did not mean that everything was perfect or even made sense. But I learned real quick that that's the power of faith. So fast forward to my now freshman year of college where I finally am healthy and finished my shoulder rehab. I, I go to play summer ball and was doing so terrible to the point where I faked an injury and just to come home. I was happy at Creighton with my friends and the schooling, but I just felt that I wasn't getting the most out of my baseball career. So I call my coach to tell him that I'm going to transfer from Creighton and go play elsewhere. But right before I submit that transfer request, I get a call from my other assistant coach, in which he talks me off the ledge of leaving and I decide to come back. I'm forever grateful for the conversation we had and the timing of it. Clearly the hand of God was in it and he had bigger plans for me at Creighton. So I go back for my sophomore year get off to a great start, and then in the middle of the spring is obviously, this is 2020, so COVID hits. The old me, the worldly fleshly version of me would want to say, why me, and complain. 
about this, but I had taken a new approach, a Christ-like approach. In a season of so much unknown, I just chose to use this time to number one, grow in my relationship with Christ and my family, and number two, continue to work hard on my craft as a pitcher. Things get somewhat back to normal in 2021, which is my junior year, and I come out and have a great spring. The draft rolls around, and come July, I go undrafted despite having such a good season. I was so confused at what I didn't do. I had no answers as to why I didn't get selected, other than my agent just told me that I wasn't good enough. We need to always remember in the midst of not being good enough in worldly terms that Galatians 1.10 says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Even taking this approach, this was really hard for me to swallow as I was just confused why God would bring me this far just to not make it. So I go back to Creighton for my senior year, my last chance at making this dream I once had a reality, wrestling with why God didn't feel I was ready to take this next step and why he continued to put me through all these trials. I then get close to my new assistant coach we had hired, a former Creighton player who also played professionally and more importantly, was on fire for the Lord. He would continually encourage me over and over again that everything was going to work out according to God's will because I was a child who willingly loved him. Romans 8, 28. Then come the, came the most horrible thing I've ever had to experience. So in the fall of 2021, my Christian mentor, my brother in Christ was brutally murdered and went to be with Jesus at the age of 37 years old. This one stung and took months to recover from. This crushed me more than anything that I've been through in my life up to this point. And again, I find myself trying to see the goodness of God in this as a now born again Christian. And I know that my brother is up there at the feet of Jesus, watching over me every day. So I then enter my spring season, definitely still wrestling a little bit with why content God continues to put me through all these difficult challenges. And now I begin to see this girl. And if you know me at the time, talking to girls was the literal last thing on my mind. But this one was different. It almost felt as if the Holy Spirit was nudging me to pursue this girl. She was an athlete, and more importantly, she loved the Lord. No way I just met my future wife, right? So we get to know each other. To put a long story short, I ask her out. She says yes. All this question is to why did God want me to stay at Creighton all these years, and why couldn't I get drafted last year came full circle in that moment. And two and a half years later, <clears throat> on the verge of getting engaged to this beautiful Christian soul, I can now see so clearly what God had been orchestrating the whole time. He is so beyond faithful. So, enter the baseball part of my spring season. I end up going out having a great year, still uncertain as if I did enough to get picked. The draft rolls around, and long story short, I end up getting a call from the New York Mets after the seventh round, telling me they're going to select me with their eighth round pick. I lost it, breaking down in tears, so overcome by so many emotions. It felt like such a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. The countless inner dialogue, wondering why I worked so hard, wondering why I had to go through all this, would keep me awake night after night. But by the power of God and God alone, I did it. With so many opportunities to give in and give up, God continued to give me strength amongst so much adversity and unknowing. It almost seemed like years later, I was now seeing the goodness and faithfulness of God so prevalently within my life and how those doors he closed was to protect me from something I wasn't ready for yet. So come 2023, I start my first pro season with the New York Mets. I shoot up through the system super fast, getting a double A in my first season before getting sidelined in August with a hip injury. I end up getting an arthroscopic hip surgery to remove bone spurs and clean up the labral tearing that had happened. I spent the next seven months rehabbing diligently just to come out in spring training in March and still be in pain. It was not easy to get this news as we decided on doing another hip surgery. As optimistic and Christ-like as I had become, this one just didn't make much sense. But like I said, with time after time, after seeing the faithfulness of God, I chose to take the high road, the Christ-like road, and just continue to control what I can control. When God closes one door, he opens another. And man, the amount of growth I've made in these last 11 and a half months of rehab is something that I can only done in a setting like this. So I'll forever be grateful for this time in my life. He has revealed so much to me and that I will forever be grateful for this setback as a pivotal moment when I reached out in faith and got involved in so much Christian community. 
It has completely changed my life for the better. Obviously, our faith is between us and God, but Psalm 133.1 says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Being able to consistently go to church every Sunday and Tuesday and getting to know people there, starting a Bible study within the Mets organization, being invited to a Bible study here at Discovery, just so many blessings in the amount of lessons I've learned from getting involved in community and not just going about my faith alone has been such a huge blessing in my life. So now I am just over four months post-op, and by the grace of God, I am back healthy and throwing off the mound again, and on track to be the fastest hip resurfacing surgery to ever return to game at five months. Praise God. The amount of lessons I have learned in the past nine years after going through all this adversity is insurmountable, and all I can do is praise the Lord for continuing to sharpen and refine me through these experiences. But more importantly, I am grateful for what he did for us on Calvary in sending his one and only son to die for our sins that he knew we would continually make so that we have a chance at eternity in heaven with him. And now I sit here as a freshly turned 25 year old with his whole life still ahead of him. I have no idea what the future holds and if playing in the big leagues is in my cards or not. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I have learned to completely surrender the outcomes of my life over to God and be more focused on the process of who I am becoming and how many people I can impact along the way. I'm less concerned with what I am working for and more concerned with who I am working for. And that is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Church, I want to encourage you to be praying for this young man that he would continue to live missionally. Amen? Amen. He would continue to live missionally. Pray for us uh, in, in a week, a week from Wednesday. He and I are going to be in uh, three, three different, uh, three different events speaking and uh, pointing people to Jesus in local schools. And so excited for that opportunity to go and to preach Jesus. Amen? That's why we exist. Hey, if you're a guest with us today, would you take out that Connect card that you were handed on the way in and begin to fill it out? Uh, if you'd rather fill out a digital copy of the Connect card rather than the printed, you can scan the seat back in front of you, and there is a digital uh, copy of that Connect card. On that Connect card is an area for prayer. We would love to pray for you. Uh, we pray here uh, in the coffee shop every Wednesday at 8.30. It's open to everyone. Come and pray with us, 8.30, right here on Wednesdays. We pray, and we would love to lift up uh, your request, whatever it may be. Let's pray. Speaking about prayer. Oh, Lord, you've been so good to us. <laughs> Thank you for this story that we've heard. What a testimony, truly for your glory. Father, thank you for those that are here in the house today. Thank you for those that are joining us online. And most importantly, thank you, Lord, for your word that is truth, that is authority. So, Father, may we have ears to hear today what you would speak. Speak now through your messenger. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're in this teaching series titled Live Missionally. Jesus has gathered the disciples. He has instructed the disciples. He has sent the disciples out and he has followed behind. And Matthew chapter 12 is where we're going to be uh, today beginning in verse 22. Last week, we looked at verses 9 through 21, verses 9 through 21. And if you read through that this afternoon, you will see that the theme is pretty clear. Jesus is both healer and hope. We've already seen Jesus performing these miracles, healing people. We've already seen that. We've, the disciples have witnessed it. The crowds of people have witnessed it. The religious leaders of the day have witnessed it. Jesus is both healer, but then... But then there's this quote from Isaiah chapter 42. This prophecy in verse 21, the scripture says, the nations will put their hope in his name. And so Jesus isn't just healer. Jesus is also hope. I don't know what you need today, but it can be found in Jesus. Amen? Amen. And may it be found in Jesus. In a world that we live in where where we can find all kinds of fake substitutes. 
May we find what we're really looking for, our heart's desire, in Christ Jesus. Oh, may he be your healing, healing and, and may he be your hope. Amen? So we see that in the text before verse 22. Verse 22, Matthew chapter 12, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him. He healed him so that the man could both speak and see. All the crowds were astounded and said, Could this be the son of David? When Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by Bezebul, the ruler of the demons, the ruler of the demons. Now, this is the third encounter in this chapter alone between Jesus and the religious leaders. You see the first encounter, uh, verses 1 through uh, 1 and 2. You, you see the second encounter, verses 9 and 10. And then the scripture before us, you see the third encounter between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day. The religious leaders of the day. They were watching and they were waiting because uh, they didn't like the message of Jesus. They didn't like uh, the miracles of Jesus. And so they're watching and they're waiting. And, and if they can just catch him, if they can just catch him not fulfilling their law or obeying their law. And so that's the encounters that we see as we read through this gospel. The Pharisees were very much trying to divide, very much trying to divide. Uh, the first of what we see of Jesus, if I can remind us of who he is today. In the scriptures before us, we see that Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is omnipotent. That's the, the word omnipotent. He's, he's all powerful. We've already seen him heal. We've already seen him uh, minister and yet again, we see him do the same. This demon-possessed, mute, blind man was brought to Jesus. Don't miss the message in that, that someone brought this man to Jesus. Who, church, are we bringing to Jesus? It's easy to come in Sunday after Sunday and warm my seat. But we were never called to be seat warmers. The, the Great Commission isn't about a comfort. The Great Commission is all about going before Jesus ascends into heaven. What does he say? Go and make disciples. The Greek language is beautiful. It's quite beautiful. And the, the language is as you are going. As you are going, make disciples. It's not just the pastor's job or the elder's job or the leadership of the church's job to make disciples. It's all of our job. It's the calling on our lives to make disciples. If you still got breath, you have been called to go and make disciples. One of the beautiful things is when all of this is said and done, we're going to be scattered. We're going to be scattered abroad. And one of the things we pray for right on Wednesdays, we pray for Wednesdays is for the church as she is scattered abroad that we might be the witness of Jesus wherever he has sent us. That we might be found faithful to be his witness wherever he's called us. And so you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again if you've been with us for some time. If you're sitting here questioning why you are where you're at, stop questioning why you are where you're at and start living on mission for Jesus until he calls you somewhere else. Live missionally. And so someone brought this man to Jesus. And this man was not only demon-possessed, this man was not only mute this man was also blind and what do we see we see that jesus displayed his complete power his complete authority over demons casting out demonic powers that the traditions of the day considered impossible see these religious leaders they didn't believe that it was possible for anyone to cast out a demon possession. But they didn't know Jesus. <laughs> they didn't know Jesus. And so here's, here's Jesus. He's walking this earth in the Galilee region, performing miracle after miracle. Why? How? Because he's Jesus. He's all powerful, Jesus. Oftentimes we look at situations and we just wonder how. How is it possible? 
Matthew 19, 26 says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We need to be reminded of that truth today, that all things are possible with the Lord our God. Amen. Amen. Jesus is all powerful. Look to verse 23 closely in your Bibles. All the crowds were astounded and said, now this isn't the first time the crowds have been amazed. They've been astounded. This isn't the first time, but yet again, they are. They find themselves in this place. They're astounded. And what? What's the question? Could this be the son of David? What, what a question to consider. Could this be the son of David? Now, the son of David is a, a rich messianic title. Those of the Jewish faith knew that the Messiah would come from the line and lineage of David, but they didn't want to believe it was Jesus that he had come. And so the the crowds, as they witness the miracle, the power of Jesus, what is their response? Could this be the son of David? Could this be the son of David? Now, this isn't the first time that rich title was used. We find it back in chapter 9, verse 27, write that reference down, 9, 27. We find that's the first time that Jesus is called the son of David. And he's called the son of David by two blind men. Two blind men. And what do they say before they even refer to him as son of David? Have mercy. They say, have mercy on us, son of David. I believe this was their confession of Jesus as the Messiah. The crowds reacted in verse 24 with, with a messianic expectation. This messianic expectation. Could this be the son of David? But the religious leaders... What do they do? They, they, they did what they've always done. Yet again, once again, they tried to credit Jesus' power to the prince of demons. Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. The Pharisees responded to Jesus' miracles with giving credit to Satan. Bezebul. That, that's a reference to, to, to Satan. They couldn't just believe that it was Jesus who is all-powerful. They tried to give the credit where the credit was not due. Verse 25, look to the text, knowing this. He told them every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will this kingdom stand? How then will this kingdom stand? Verse 27, and if I drive out demons by Bezebul, by whom do your sons drive them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house? The theme of Jesus' response to the religious leaders is this very clearly. A divided house will not stand a divided house will not stand in the text before us what we see is not only is jesus all powerful but jesus is all knowing now i understand this might be a little elementary if you've been in church any length of time this this might be elementary but but i just i just wonder how often do we forget the one whom we serve. We forget what he is capable of. What a reminder to the church. What a reminder to, to my soul that Jesus, Savior, is all powerful and he is all knowing. May we not lose sight of who Jesus is today. Amen. Amen. I love the beginning of verse 25, knowing their thoughts. Matthew, the gospel writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He knew who Jesus was. He had spent time with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. And, and, and so knowing their thoughts, again, Jesus, all-powerful, but also all-knowing, omniscient, 
Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he responded with every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. Again, a divided, a divided house will not stand, will not stand. For 15 plus years, we have held to a few core values at this church. And one of those core values is unity. In fact, I want to invite those that have not attended Next Move. That's the entryway really to discovery. Next Sunday, following both the 9 a.m. and the 1030, we have Next Move. Pastor Zach will be leading that. That's the intro to discovery. And and at Next Move, he'll share some of the values, those four values briefly of discovery. And one of those values is, is unity. Why is that a value of ours? It's a value because united we stand. United we advance the gospel. If there's division, we ain't going nowhere, right? I mean, what kind of impact are we making for the kingdom of God? I, I've said it for many years now. The enemy wants us so uh, 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 distracted in fighting one another that we're not fighting him we got to be very careful of the play of the enemy. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And so in this church, listen, listen closely. In this church, we will fight for unity. We will fight for unity. We will continue to give our lives for, for unity. We will fight for it. Jesus speaks to kingdoms. In the text before us, he speaks of Two kingdoms, and these two kingdoms are in opposition to each other. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And until the present age closes, uh, or the church age, until the church age closes, these two kingdoms will continue to be at war with one another. It's the world we're living in. I wonder which, which kingdom are you a part of? And some might say, why would you ask a question like that? It's the church. <laughs> oh, hell. It's 2024. <laughs> but which kingdom? Which kingdom are you a part of? Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Would you write that reference down? Colossians 1, 13 says, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. Have you rescued have you been rescued? Have you been transferred from the domain of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, and transferred into the kingdom of Jesus? Verse 14 says, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In him, in Christ Jesus, we have redemption. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And some might be here today, some might be joining us online today, and you might be thinking, you don't know what I've done, you don't know my past, you don't know all the sins, you don't even know this week what just, what just kind of went on in my mind and my heart, uh, you don't know the actions, you don't know any of this, I, and I might not know, and I, and, 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 and I may never know, <laughs> but there's one who does. And, and he still loved humanity enough to send his one and only son, Jesus, over 2,000 years ago to die on a cross, a Roman cross, to be crucified on that, that cross as our brother already shared the gospel with us. And Jesus was on that cross, hanging on that cross, his blood shed on that cross for sinners like you and for sinners like me and for sinners uh, all around the world so that we might be redeemed. And that's what Jesus does. Part of this redemption is to transfer us from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Jesus. And I wonder which kingdom are you a part of uh, today? Which kingdom are you a part of today? Look to verse 30. Anyone who is not with me is against me. Jesus didn't mix his words. Uh, anyone who is not with me is, is against me. Anyone who's not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Anyone who does not gather with me scatters. You run, you flee. Verse 31, therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. 
But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the one to come. We've already seen that Jesus is all powerful. We've already seen that Jesus is all knowing. But, but lastly, lastly, may I remind us today that Jesus is the all sufficient Savior. Jesus is the all-sufficient Savior. And how are we united in his kingdom? We're, we're, we're united. Jesus you, unites us. We're united by his blood that was shed for us. I wonder, are you, are you with Jesus? Are you participating in living missionally? He said, anyone who is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Morgan Campbell once wrote, only two forces are at work in the world, the gathering and the scattering, the gathering and the scattering. Whoever does the one contradicts the other. Whoever does the one contradicts the other. How, how, do, we, how do we live for Jesus and, and, and live for self at the same time? It's, it's impossible. It's impossible for there to be two number ones. There's only one number one. I don't know what has that place in your life today, but I pray that before all this is said and done, it would be the Lord our God, that he would have his rightful place, that he would be the number one priority, the number one affection, the number one satisfaction in your life. Whose kingdom are you living for? Whose kingdom are you part of? Whose team are you on? Dylan shared his testimony and I was thinking yesterday I, I do some of my best thinking while I'm on a, a mower I don't know about you I don't know where you do your best thinking but Saturdays generally I'm on a mower and I'm mowing no phone calls no no technology it's just me and the Lord something about it and then and then when it's and then when it's over man it feels so good it's like man, check check that off the list man strike it, it feels so good it smells so good and, and so I, I'm, I'm riding this riding this mower and I had this thought I had this thought of how wild would it be? How wild would it be if on, uh, you know, Dylan makes it through this rehab and, and his, first, his first call, he runs out and he takes the mound and he's proudly wearing this Mets jersey here on the bottom, but on the top, he's proudly wearing his Yankees hat. Now, how... How crazy would that be? Anyone that doesn't know baseball, you can ask somebody afterwards what I'm talking about, and you'll understand. Uh, Yankees fans don't like Mets fans, and Mets fans don't like Yankees fans, and they're all from New York. I don't know. That's probably why, but no, we won't go there. We, we love you if you're from New York. We, 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 in Christ Jesus, we love you. And, and so, but how wild would that be? I mean, because he's all in with the mess, right? You, you signed something, I'm sure. They gave you, they gave you a couple dollars at least. And, and uh, but how, so how wild would it, would it be? And some of you are like, yeah, that would be crazy. Right? We would never see it. We would never see it. That would make the not top 10 on Fridays ESPN, I guarantee, right? <laughs> As I was thinking about two different kingdoms, and I was thinking about Jesus' words to us. I'm processing all of this, praying through it all. I just can't help but think how many professing Christians there are that say all the right things, but, but their life is complete opposite. And I just wonder, Whose team are you on? Whose kingdom are you a part of? Who are you living for? And some of y'all might be thinking, uh, Tim, that's, that's pretty judgy. I, I, I would rather use the word a, accountable. I, I believe that there's evidence that we belong to him. If you've confessed that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you realize that you are a sinner, that Jesus is the Savior, 
You've received the gift of salvation. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you. There must be a change. John chapter 15, verse 26 says this. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. He will testify about me. See, the religious leaders' uh, rejection of Jesus, especially considering all that they uh, witnessed, all that they, all that they, all that they heard, showed that they completely rejected the Holy Spirit's ministry. Hence, the warning of committing the unforgivable sin. And so, the Holy Spirit's main ministry is to testify of Jesus. By his power, you and I have been called to testify of Jesus. Everywhere he sends us, every person we encounter, testify of Jesus. As we close today, I, I want to remind us that Jesus is the head of this church. Jesus is the head of the church. It's Jesus' church. And what our prayers is that uh, Discovery will would never have the reputation. Oh, that's Tim's church. I've been in some conversations even this week where it's that person's church or that person's church. And I just shake my head in this feeling with it. Just something churns within me and said, no, where have we missed it? It can't be this person's church. It's Jesus' church. Hey, listen, Jesus alone provides the salvation that humanity needs. It's Jesus alone. And so the church is Jesus. It's Jesus' church. You and I belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. We exist to testify of Jesus. It's Jesus who is the pioneer and perfecter of our, our faith. It's Jesus to which we've been called to live missionally. And I pray that, that this week, that we want to miss the opportunities, knowing who Jesus is, all-powerful, all-knowing, and the all-sufficient Savior, that we would unite together all mission to be his witness. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place and online with us for a moment? Would you just get alone with the Lord and, and would you just simply say, what is my response, God? God, what is my response from this? What do you want me to do with this message? We've been called to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so, Jesus, what, is, what do you want me to do with this? Some of you know already. Some of you considering your past week, and your current life. Maybe some straight off the path. And that this today is a reminder to come home. Start living for the Lord Jesus, his kingdom, his glory. As people are praying all across this place online with us, as people are praying, I wonder if there might be one here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. You've heard the gospel now several times. And I, I wonder, have you made the commitment to follow Jesus? To make him Lord of your life? To forgive you of all your sins? To give you a hope of heaven? And the answer is no. Will you today? The Spirit of God is moving in your life. Would you receive the gift of salvation that is in Christ Jesus? As people are praying all across this place, if that is you, would you say, dear Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I am a sinner. 
And I believe this day that you are the Savior. And I trust you completely for the salvation of my soul, for the forgiveness of all my sins. I trust you. I believe in you. You walked this earth, you died on a cross. You were placed in a grave and you rose victorious on that third day for me. I believe in you. Starting this day, for the rest of my life, I surrender to your lordship. You hold that number one place in my life. Use me for your glory. If that's your prayer today, would you thank him for saving you? As we sing this, this song, there's going to be men and women. If you're in the house, there's going to be men and women in the different corners of this room. And I want to encourage you. There's something weighing heavy on your heart today. Would you have the courage to step out of your seat and move forward? If you're online with us, there's a host that would love to pray with you. Would you just comment? Prayer. We'd love to pray with you. But whatever it is, it's holding you back from living missionally. Would you take that next step of faith today? Would you trust Jesus today? Would you lean in on a brother or sister to pray with you, for you? Maybe you're wondering, what is your next step? Maybe your next step is baptism, like, like we just celebrated Tommy taking that next step. We praise God for him. Maybe that's your next step. Whatever it might be today, would you trust the Lord? And would you move in faith? Lord Jesus, to you be all the glory and all the honor. Lord, take our lives. You are the firm foundation. You are the one who unites us. Use us now for your glory. Help us to be led by your Holy Spirit in all things. Lord, it's to you and your kingdom that we've been transferred. You are the king. There's only one king. So we submit to you. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus for your glory, we pray, amen.